Data Skeptic is the official podcast of dataskeptic.com, bringing you stories, interviews, and mini episodes on topics in data science, machine learning, statistics, and artificial intelligence. I don't know if I have an official list of top 10 algorithms, but surely the backpropagation algorithm belongs on there because it's very important. This is how you train a neural network. I came up with a little game that'll help with some of the intuition. Why don't you tell me what I've placed in front of you? I have two phones in front of me. They're both in the Maps app. Well, one of them looks like the desert, and one of them has a river that says Yellowstone River. So effectively random locations, let's just say. We're going to do something like the backpropagation algorithm. Not exactly, but it's a game. It's going to show you the basic concept. So what I want you to do is to move these maps around in very specific steps. So in one step, you can pinch zoom if you want by like a lot or a little, your choice. Or you could scroll, you know, like just move it a lot or a little. Or you could fling, you know, where it shoots it across the map. So let's go in different rounds and maybe even count the rounds. I want you to focus one of the maps on our current home here in Los Angeles and the other map on your former home where you did some growing up, not all of your growing up, but a lot of your growing up in North Carolina. Okay. Okay. So I guess I'll just start with our current home. Okay. I'll just hit the pinpoint button. <laughs> no, that's cheating. Oh. <laughs> I want you to do it. <laughs> the options I said, pinch zoom, fling, or just scroll. Oh, Okay. Well, then I will pinch and zoom out. <laughs> All right. And that's a single move. Just do one pinch. I can only do one? Yeah. I mean, you can do it as big or as small as you want. Can I do it want. as a fling? Pinch zoom? No combinations. Just the... But I'm just going to do it quickly so I can zoom out. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. Now, did you zoom out by a lot or a little? I think with a lot. Well, first of all, can you tell where it is? It says Fallon. Nope. Go ahead and do the other one. Make an action there. The the, other, my other phone? The other phone, yeah. Which I'm trying to go to. You get to pick which phone shows which place, but by the end of this, and we're on round one, you have to have your current and previous home on the maps. Okay, I'll just do the zoom out too. Yep, now I see there's Seattle. How far would you say each of these maps are from their goal state? In terms of miles? Yeah, roughly speaking. Well, Seattle from North Carolina is probably at least 2,000. Mm -hmm. so. How far from Los Angeles? Seattle is closer to L.A. So now let's go to round two. And same thing. You can do a pinch, a fling, or a move. Phone one. I will zoom out again. It says it's an Indian reserve. All right. Well, that narrows it down a little bit. It's probably not helpful to you. I don't know where all the reserves are. All right. Let's go to the other phone. I'm going to fling it south as much as I can because LA is south of Seattle. Okay. Oops. <laughs> a big fling off into the ocean. I'm in the ocean. Wow, <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, round three. Let's do it again. Okay, with the phone one, I will pinch the zoom out again. Now you went a little too far. I see the entire continent. Yeah. That's okay. Eastward, because uh -huh. I do not know where I am. Could be in Mexico. I'm not sure, though. All right, now let's reassess again. Approximately, how close are these two phones to their destination? Well, I'm on the right continent. All right, yeah, that's a start. So I'd say I'm near. Let's go on to round four. Phone one, I will zoom in. All right. So phone one is North Carolina. All right, so you did one big zoom. You went from the whole continent down to what? North Carolina, the East Coast. Okay, so you got a couple of states, though. So you did a big zoom. How come you did a big zoom? Each of these movements are by a lot because I'm off by a lot. Zooming in. All right, you zoomed in from the East Coast down to approximately what now? The triangle area. All right, so you got the whole triangle, so that's progress. You're closer, right? Okay, the other phone. I will swipe north and west because I believe I'm in Texas. All right, where did you end up? I'm not sure, but it says Lubbock. Oh, yeah, so Lubbock, I think Texas. That's Texas. I just sent somebody a t shirt in Lubbock, Texas. Phone number one. I will zoom in again. Do so you see the whole triangle? Now you're going to do a Durham. Full fingered zoom? Yep. You're getting closer, right? How how many moves do you think you have left till you get to your home and your well, I don't home? actually remember where my home was, oh. <laughs> so I'm not actually sure. That part of the analogy breaks down because in most cases in back propagation and in most neural networks, you know the goal states. You can measure the difference between what you have and where you want to be. I think I remember. I will pinch zoom in to the area I believe it's at. All right. Now, I noticed you didn't pinch zoom the entire screen. You held back a little bit. How come? I was waiting for it to load to see what road it was. Mm. Okay, phone number two. I will now zoom in to L.A. Looks like I could see Bakersfield in L.A. All right, you're getting closer. Keep going. Okay, phone number one. 
Oh, I think I can see our house street, so I'll zoom in on that street. Okay, well, I'm, I'm basically on the street of where we live, so I'm not sure how close I should get. Oh, get it, get exact. Get as, as zoomed in as you can where you focus the screen on your old home. Going to phone number two. I have Irvine and San Bernardino. All right, getting close. Big zoom there. Going back to the North Carolina one. All right, what's going on there? It looks like you might be down to the maximum zoom on phone number one. I mean, that's the house, so I could center it in my next move. All right, in your next move, you'll center it. Zooming, I could see the highways that are very close to us. Yeah, it's only maybe 50 feet to Mm -hmm. the left. What would you estimate was the distance on your earliest move? Thousands of miles. Yeah, probably. All right, keep going. You basically solved one phone. Okay, I'm only going to do phone number two now. Okay. I could see our neighborhood streets. I'll zoom in again. I'll slide it down. I'll zoom in again. Centering it two blocks away, so I'll zoom in again. I could see our house. Okay, I was there. My house right. is already there. You pretty there. much nailed it. Here's the analogy I want to draw from this little ordeal I put you through. First of all, why two phones? Well, in a neural network, you have a ton of weights. What do you mean by weights? So a neural network is composed of a bunch of neurons, and they each have links from one another. So they depend on previous neurons, and each of those links is weighted. For how important they are? Exactly, yeah. So, so, so what are the weights on this map? The map isn't directly a neural network task. The emphasis I want to make here is on how much you change it, because that's what backpropagation is all about. So in backpropagation, you have this neural network. And initially, you make all the weights random. And then you give it some input. The input could be like an image or a document or just about anything you want. And then you pass it through the network. For each neuron, you look at all of its input neurons. And then you multiply the value by the weight. And you come up with some number. And you propagate that throughout the whole network until you get to the output. And then you compare what you calculated to what the actual value should have been. That's what's called the loss function. And there's lots of different kinds of loss functions. Generally, you do the sum of the square of the differences. So you take your target minus what you calculated, which is your output, and you square that difference. We're going to take a quick break from our show to talk about our sponsor for this week, Periscope Data. I use a lot of different tools on a day-to-day basis, yet I find Slack is really the centerpiece of communication between myself and my collaborators. We keep our business-related Slack chatter private, just like we keep many of our Periscope Data dashboards private. Security can sometimes be an inconvenience, forcing me to adopt slow processes with screenshotting and uploading all kinds of craziness like that. That's why I'm excited to tell you about my experience with Periscope Data Slack integration. If I'm in a discussion where a picture truly is worth a thousand words, I can cut and paste the URL of the Periscope Data dashboard and drop that directly into Slack. Because I have their integration installed, Slack knows how to handle that URL and also takes care of the security. It retrieves our dashboard and publishes it naturally right into the Slack channel, allowing all the team to see the data from our dashboarding tool of choice embedded directly in our communication tool of choice. If you'd like to try that out for yourself, head on over to periscopedata.com slash skeptics to start a free trial. Once again, that's periscopedata.com slash skeptics. Let's talk about the loss function in terms of this little game here. If you were centered your map precisely on the location you wanted, that would be zero loss, right? Because the difference between where you want it to be and where it is is no different. They're the same place. But if the map on your screen doesn't show the destination you're looking for, then you can take the distance from what you're showing to where you want to be, and that's the error. Yeah, but how does this relate to neural networks? Let's say we have a neural network that wants to detect if there's a bird in a photo. All of the inputs are the pixel intensity values from an image, and the output is just a simple yes or no. If you initialize it randomly and you give it a picture that either does or doesn't have a bird in it, it's going to do a really bad job, right? Because why would random weights come up with anything useful? But you say, well, this answer should have been a yes, but it wasn't. So now you want to improve all those weights until you get weights that are actually good at making predictions. So how do you do that improvement? Well, you have to do some calculus here. Did you take calculus? Yeah. Do you remember the chain rule? No. All right. Well, you don't have to remember it for this mini episode. That is the real key to understanding backpropagation and like actually passing a test on the subject. But just to get the high level understanding of what it is. Do you remember what a derivative is? I don't remember. I think it had like the shape of a violin, like FX. Uh, That's the way you write it. The derivative is the rate at which something is changing. So if you think of like being in a car, 
you're driving, let's say you're at a starting line on a racetrack. And then as you start to drive, you have a distance from the start. That's your position. The rate of change is your velocity. The rate of the rate of change is acceleration. See how that works? That's the second derivative. But all we really need here is the first derivative. You can calculate the error for the total neural network. For a given instance, how close was it to the correct answer? You want to look at all the weights in the system and you say, well, if this weight changed just a little bit, how much does that affect the error? So let's say there's a neuron in there that's not really doing anything. It's not involved in the actual calculation. If you change it, you don't end up changing the error very much. But let's say you find one neuron that is misbehaving very badly. And when you change its weight, maybe you make it much higher or much lower, and suddenly the error goes down. Well, that's a weight you want to improve, right? What if it's just influential? What do you mean? It's only sensitive because it matters. That sounds profoundly correct, but I have no idea what it means. <laughs> Can you walk me through that? I don't have anything else to say. It was just I thought I was in, what, what if the weight was correct? That should just never happen? If the weight is correct, in other words, if it's at a good value, yeah. then changing it could only hurt the overall error, right? So if it's a reliable weight that's very influential, then you don't want to change how it does things. So when you update that weight, you maybe change it by only a tiny amount or not at all. But if there's another neuron somewhere that's doing a really bad job, it's like hurting the overall calculation, then changing it by some amount should reduce the overall error of the system. So then you go through each weight and you say, it's kind of like imagine if every weight was a little knob and your job was to like make a light as bright as possible and you just go twist every knob by a little bit. You just fiddle with it. And if it helps the problem, be like, oh, I need to turn this one up a lot. But if it's, you know, already pretty good, you maybe only fine tune it a tiny amount. It's kind of like the other analogy I thought of. Do you remember those games we seem to have when we were kids where it's like a 2D surface that's like a maze and you have a marble and then you have these two knobs and one turns the board left, you know, like side to side and the other one turns it left to right kind of. Mm -hmm. And you have to navigate the ball through the whole maze mm -hmm. and make it not fall in the holes that are there. Did you ever Ball maze. Ball maze. Did you ever have one of those growing up? No. Really? Only the things that came in a Happy Meal. Really? I figured, I thought everyone had one of those games at some point. How big was it? Usually they were like 12 by 12. That is big. Mine were like the size of our cell phone. Smaller. You know what? There were some like party favorite ones that had a ball bearing inside now that yeah. I think of it. Oh, okay. So those games, similar idea. If moving the knob a little bit makes the system overall a little bit better, you would move it a little bit. But if it needs to go a lot, you'd shift it a lot. So the whole key to back propagation is going through every weight and finding the gradient with respect to the overall error. So it's kind of like saying, hey, let's think about just this one neuron for a second. If I change it, does it seem to make this better? Now, backpropagation can get stuck in local minima. That's probably a topic for another day, but I should just mention they're likely to get you to a good answer, but they struggle in plateaus and stuff like that. So this is, to the best of my knowledge, the most popular way of training a neural network. So it goes in two phases, just to review a little bit. First is the forward propagation step. You want to give it an input, push it through your network, and calculate your output. Based on the current weights you have, what output do you calculate? Then you compare that to the output you'd like to get. And probably at the start, it's really far off. So then you go through and you start looking mathematically at each weight. And you say, well, what is the local gradient? If I change it a little bit, how does that affect the error? And you move it in the direction that reduces the error. And you keep doing that for every neuron and then a new example. And you just keep iterating until you converge on a nice solution. Do you overcorrect? Yeah, actually you can. Because the gradient you're only measuring locally. It might seem like, oh, for where we are now, I want to fling the map way across the country or like do fling it really far. But then uh, when you see that it's gotten you close, but maybe you overshot it, then you have to go back and fling a little less. Kind of like golf in that way too, right? I guess, I mean, I'm not a golfer, but I assume your first swing, you just want to get maximum distance. Maybe you end up a little bit past the tee and then you got to progressively make shots that go smaller distances and become more refined. And that's mm -hmm. what backpropagation is doing. It's doing that with gradient descent. And you can overfit like any model? Yeah, pretty much every machine learning algorithm in the world can overfit. Backpropagation is no exception. Although there are some very specific techniques developed primarily for this algorithm to help prevent it from overfitting. So we'll talk about some of those. Actually, we did. We talked about dropout once before. But there's a couple other clever tricks like that too. But good instincts. Yeah, overfitting can be a major issue when you have a whole bunch of neurons. Too much tweaking. Yeah, you over tweaked it. That can definitely be the case. Tweak, tweak, tweak. 
Anyway, thanks as always for joining me, Linda. Thank you. And until next time, I want to remind everyone to keep thinking skeptically of and with data. Good night, Linda. Good night. Data Skeptic is a listener-supported program. To support the show, visit dataskeptic.com and click on the membership tab.